a three channel dimmer for DC loads. This one can run on 12 or 24 volts. In this case, I've connected a little bit of 50 50 tape to it and I'm running it in 12 volts. And if I adjust these knobs, I can bring up individual colors. So there's red, there's green, there's blue, and then you can mix colors. So say I want a turquoise, I can bring in both blue and green or I can bring up red and blue and get some interesting magenta pinky type shades. And effectively with this, you can get every color that you can possibly achieve out of this tape. So let's take it to bits. So I shall unplug this and unscrew it. Now I had one of these before. I wonder if it's changed. The one I had before was based, that's not even fitting. The one I had before was based on a microcontroller, which was a bit of a surprise. It was basically using the potentiometers on analog to digital input. So it would basically convert the position of the potentiometer between the 5 volt and 0 volt rail to a digital number inside the processor. And then either it generated the pulses modulation in software or it used um, dedicated pulses modulation modules built Pulse width modulation modules built into the processor. Is it going to be the same? It's not the same. Oddly, I thought, oh, actually, they've allowed for it. They've allowed for the potentiometers to be mounted in the circuit board here, but they've not actually done it. They've mounted them separately. What do we have here, then? Hold on. Uh, you guys can probably see this better than me. We have three big MOSFETs that output... This is probably a voltage regulator. I shall take a picture of this and reverse engineer it. I want to see though. There's a 555. Okay, so that's generating this sort of probably a ramp, I'd guess. And what are these? A1612. Three, oh, 358S. Oh, they're, they're uh, dual op amps. 358, like the LM358. Okay, tell you what. I'm going to take a picture of this and then we'll reverse engineer it. One moment, please. The reverse engineering is complete. I had to hold this down with sticky tape because uh, I could have taken the potentiometer leads off, but they actually just kept kicking the circuit board up at an angle. Made it hard to take a picture, but I got a picture. And it shows the incoming supply over here going to a diode going through a diode and then a resistor. It's quite odd. It's marked as a 100 ohm resistor. All the components are marked on the board, which is nice. But this one, they've swapped out for a different value. An oddly specific resistor. They've got a missing capacitor here in the, the sort of pre-regulation side. 78L05 regulator, a couple of smoothing capacitors, and then it feeds the circuitry, which is based in the 555, and it used in a fairly non-standard configuration. I mean, it's not super non-standard, but it's not the way you'd expect. And then the dual op amps. This one only has one of the op amps used. This one has both. And they're comparing the uh, the input on one of their input pins from these potentiometers, which are connected more or less to the supply rails, the 5 volt supply rails, but via resistors to fine tune where they operate within the actual the voltage rail. And then it's going to these three MOSFETs and the output, which is switched whatever you've got connected to the zero volt rail. That is more or less it. Let us bring in the schematic. I shall move this out the way. So here's the 12 or 24 volt rail. You can use it from, technically speaking, you could use it from probably about 9 volts upwards, although that resistor skews that a bit. But it derives uh, a supply. This is where that would have been quite handy, having that little decoupling capacitor, but they haven't. However, it derives a supply with polarity protection for the circuitry from the 12 to 24 volt supply. This is a resistor that was marked 100 ohms, but they've actually used 86.6 ohms. Maybe they found 100 ohms was just a bit too high, and it resulted with the load of the circuitry, uh, particularly because it has an LED on the 5 volt side. Maybe it just caused uh, a bit of voltage fluctuation because it was maybe limiting the current a bit too much. The 5 volt regulator then drives that LED via the 1K resistor. It has two capacitors, 1.1 microfarad, 100 nanofarad, and 110 microfarad. They are actually marked on the circuit board, which is quite nice. That's these two here, 104 for the 100 nano and 106 for the 10 microfarad. It's tiny for a 10 microfarad capacitor. 
old people like me are impressed but also mortified that they've got them so small because they also blow up and feel quite a lot because they've over miniaturized them. Now I'm going to show you a simplified version of 555. I've drawn the 555 as a box here but this transistor is actually built into the 555 itself. It's a really common, it's ancient, it's one of the earliest microcontrollers that goes back a long way, still very popular, still it's just a great building block. The 555 has the ability to monitor a voltage level. In this case, it's the voltage across this capacitor. When you turn this unit on, that capacitor starts charging between this via current flowing through this 1K resistor and 10K resistor. So it starts charging up and you can see I've drawn a sort of sawtooth there of what happens. And once it reaches a voltage threshold, the 555 turns an output on. Normally it would turn its output pin 3 on and it would be used to switch a load with something like a square wave or something like that. But in this instance, all it does is it turns on its internal transistor that's used to actually discharge that capacitor and it starts discharging it via the 10K resistor. Once it reaches a low threshold, it then turns that transistor off and it starts charging again. This is normally something that we normally don't see happening in the 555. We normally just see the, the square wave output, but in this case, they're actually using this ramping effect on the output. So because of that uh, effect, the capacitor charges up again till it reaches the upper threshold, which is just below the 5 volts. The transistor turns on, it discharges to almost 0 volts, the transistor turns off and it charges up again to almost 5 volts. It just keeps doing that and it does so in a sawtooth. I measured it, I scoped it to see that waveform and it was roughly about 500 hertz. That is fed to the input of an op-amp. Now, the, an op-amp is two inputs. They call it the positive-negative input. That's purely the relationship of the input and the output. Uh, input, the two inputs versus the output. An op-amp compares two voltages. If one is higher than the other, the output will go to one state. If it's lower than the other, it will go to the other state. So what they've got here, they've chosen the same value resistors in both instances, 910 ohms on either side of this potentiometer. I did not measure that potentiometer resistance. How remiss of me. Tell you what, I'm going to try and measure that now. I will try measuring it now. It's in circuit, so it's not going to be that easy. But we'll see what happens. I'll make a wild guess. It's going in the range probably of about 10k, 20k. Other circuitry could interfere with this. 0.7. Okay, so maybe it's a 1k potentiometer. Uh, maybe it's a 680 ohm potentiometer. I'm going to make a wild guess that they've chosen a standard value and this is other components interfering and that is in reality a 1k potentiometer. I'm trying to see text in it. The only text I can see is in the back. I'm not seeing the, the value, but I'm going to make a wild guess. It's roughly 1000 ohms. So the potentiometer can be adjusted between this end, which is the sort of high volt, and this end, which is the low volt. And it's stopped from going all the way up to 5 volts by this resistor. It sets a sort of mid-margin. And likewise, at the other end, it's stopped from going all the way to 0 volts by this. And they're just being used to fine-tune the range of the potentiometer. That is that voltage that it puts in is then compared to this ramping waveform. And this is very similar to a Class D amplifier. Depending on the point at which this waveform is above the voltage of the output from the potentiometer, the MOSFET will be driven. So it will go, ultimately, it will pulsive modulate it according to that. I'll show you in more detail in a moment. So here's the MOSFET. It's a P50NO3LDG. Uh, hold on, STP36NF06L. I think uh, that is to do with the voltage rating 50 volts and 3 amps. It does say it's a 3 amp unit. Cable is switching 3 amps. And this can control resistive or LED loads. However, if you want to control an inductive load, if you want to use this to control 3 motors, it's important to note you'd externally you'd have to add a diode across the, each motor or whatever you connected just as a ba to suppress the back EMF spikes because this is designed to control LEDs. It's not designed to control inductive loads, but you could if you added that back EMF spike diode. 
And that's more or less it. It looks so simple. This is all just multiplied three times. The 555 feeds all the inputs. Uh, in fact, you can see that. Uh, this is the entire schematic here. Um, there's no other side to it, the entire layer. You can see that the 555 in the yellow here, that's feeding four inputs. It's actually feeding the input of the op amp that has only one section used, but they've just taken it through that pin as a standard pin. Um, but that effectively, those two units gives the three channels. It could, technically speaking, if they'd done other things with the circuit board, including the fact that they've uh, passed a pad, a track under that pad, uh, they could have actually made it a four channel by adding an extra potentiometer. It wouldn't have really added too much. An extra MOSFET, the other part of that, and uh, an extra potentiometer and two resistors would have been all that would have been needed to make it four way. But it doesn't really matter. It's an RGB controller. Now let me show you how this ramping effect works. So the orange indicates the potentiometer voltage, and as long as the ramping output from the 555 is above it, the output will be on. So in this case, it's been turned to an extreme end. It's actually never, ever going to be able to reach the orange line, so it stays off. Likewise, if you turn it the, the other way around, and because of those, the way they've, the tuning of those resistors, it actually it moves out of the range, so that it, if you turn it up, it will gradually get brighter and brighter, but when it gets to the end of the range, it will basically, in this zone here, it won't actually be adjusted anymore. It will just stay static, but they've just fine-tuned that into the potentiometers. But in this case, I've got a green pen for this just to show. In this case, because it's always above it, it's always on. The output is continually switched. If you turn it to the halfway position, the... Sawtooth has to be, it's not really a sawtooth, it's a triangular wave is a better way to describe it. But it's above that about half the time. So what happens is, as soon as it goes above that one, it turns it on and you end up that the output is active for this period of time and then not active in this bit, but then it becomes active in the next bit. So you end up with roughly 50-50 mark space ratio. In the case of a low setting, it only reaches the potentiometer voltage at the top of that triangular wave. So it's only lit for a very short period of time. So what you actually get out of the pulse with modulation form is a very low on ratio to off ratio. It's mostly off, but short spikes of on. And likewise, at the opposite end of the scale, when you've got it set to a fairly high position, but not full position, it will be lit for this period of time and this period of time. So it spends a lot of time on with very little portion off. And basically speaking, by turning this knob, you're controlling that where that orange line is in the uh, triangular waveform. And effectively, that creates the different sort of pulse with modulation ratios. Uh, the mark space ratio will always add up to be sort of equal. It will just the actual width of the on to the off ratio will change. Technically speaking, if you wanted to change the output pulse of modulation frequency of this, because it is around about 500 hertz, the component change would be this 100 nanofarad capacitor, because that's the timing capacitor. But note that these op amps are driving the MOSFET gates directly. And a MOSFET gate has some level of capacitance. If you turn the frequency up too high, uh, it would affect the operation. It, it may end up that the MOSFETs get hotter because they're operating more in their linear region because they're turning, this can't turn them on and off fast enough. And also it means that when you turn it down to the low end, the timing, the impedance, the ability to supply current to charge that capacitance in the MOSFET might actually stop it sort of operating. It might reduce the range it can operate over. But that's it. It's quite nicely made. It's not bad. It's very simple and it is a proper pulse with modulation controller based on very traditional circuitry, the, the op amps and that sort of waveform. It reminds me of the, uh, the old uh, phase angle control, which did use the ramp. It would have a, basically, it would be a ramp like that, a sawtooth wave, and it would compare it and that would vary where in the sine wave, each half of the sine wave, it actually turned on. But this case, because it's pulse with modulation, they're doing it differently. It is just a simple triangular wave. I've not really seen a 555 used like that for a long time. Pin 3. Let me show you in this. 
Pin 3, which is the switched output that we'd normally use for flashing our LEDs or switching relays, is not used. And they've kind of, because they're not using it, they've not even soldered it. They've just, is that to save solder? Is it just because they maybe thought they were going to pass a track under there because they had a spare space they could do that? But they've basically printed a screen print, just like they've done there where the track does, the negative does actually pass under another input, I think. Is it an input? No, it's an output. It's the output to that would have gone to another MOSFET if they'd actually made that four channel. Interesting circuitry. Different to the previous one, which was the microprocessor based one. But um simpler, functional. Uh, technically speaking, if you wanted, you could possibly boost up the MOSFETs. It offers a certain element of serviceability. You can also have that. You can also use those. You can get uh, amplifiers for RGB that basically take that signal out and they buffer it up to higher current. But it's all logical. It's all very simple and it's quite a nice arrangement. So um, I want to mention that the first one I got, the microcontroller based one, I gave it away. I gave it to a friend because I was working on the tattoo, the Royal Edinburgh Millie tattoo with my co-workers. And we had this game, we connected it to some RGB tape, and we had a game that uh, we'd say lemon yellow, and then someone would have to set it to that colour, or we'd say olive green, they'd have to set it to that, or blueberry, and we'd, it was just this silly thing that we're just trying to set it to, and then we'd each ju we'd judge them on how close the colour they got. But he was a teacher in a, a local school, and he said, this would be so good for teaching kids about the colour relationships, you know, how mixing colours results in other things. So I just gave him it. I thought it would be very good for that. So that is probably still in use at that school, being used to teach uh, how colour mixing, red, green and blue, can be used to actually make various colours. But interesting, I do like this. It's a nice functional design, very different to the one that I had before. Uh, nice that it's based on the 555 in that way, and just LM358, one of two building block electronic chips. Uh, it's a really good design. It's very nice. I like it.